Good morning, we should get started. Thank you for being the brave few um, to come to our presentation this morning. Uh, we appreciate it, but of course we know that we have folks online as well, um, and there will be a recording. <clears throat> so first, excuse me. <clears throat> So first of all, I'd like to introduce our panelists. As you can see from the slide here, we actually are only three in person. We've had two of our panel actually step out um, for different reasons. One is because uh, the person is a PhD student and actually couldn't afford to pay the online fees for this conference, which is a great shame. We wish he were here to give his presentation on the Moravians at Sea Project. And the other person is Juan Garces, who is at the, <clears throat> the Saxon Library. I have to get my water. Um, and he wasn't able to get away, but his content is going to be folded into Alexander's. So let re me introduce myself. My name is Katie Fall. I teach at Bucknell University. And actually now I am an administrator at that university and I'm doing my best to support the kinds of work that the innovative work that we are doing. And I've also um, been working on Moravian Lives project for about 10 years. I have been researching the Moravians for my whole academic career. My background is in uh, Germanistic, so German studies and DH I started about 10 years ago. Before that, I was working with GIS a great deal and cultural heritage. Um, I've published uh, uh, mainly in the field of gender studies, race studies, most recently also in network theory. And um, my latest book is coming out soon, which is an edition and translation of mission diaries by the Moravians in um, Pennsylvania and New York State. Our second presenter today is Philip Turgel, um, who studied history and Protestant theology at the University of Mainz. He <clears throat> then went on in his master's um, in digital methodology and is presently working as a software developer at the Karlsruhe Institute of Te Technology. Alexander Lasch is our third presenter. He has been at the Technical University of Dresden since 2017. He is professor and chair of German linguistics and history of the German language. He, his um, focus is on construction, grammar, language, and religion. He is also the dean of studies for the DH master's program in Dresden um, and uh, collaborates with others on Moravian sources. Um, all of the panelists, both those who are in absentia and those who are here, were present at a a digital Moravian roundtable that was held in January 2021, um, hosted by Bucknell University during COVID, obviously. Also present at that time was the whole local development team, which consisted of Diane Jakaki, Kerry Perman, Leo Bottinelli, and our student researchers as well, um, and Michael McGuire, and also collaborators from the University of Gothenburg, and the University of Mainz as well. And really from that digital round table, we had started to talk about and build infrastructures that allowed us to share the metadata um, that we have developed um, in Moravian Lives with other projects as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, today. <clears throat> so for those of you who are not historians of religion or who are not up on pietism. I'll give a quick description of what pietism is. Um, the recently published Pietism Handbook describes pietism as one of the most significant shapers of European and North American Protestantism in the post-Reformation period. With its em emphasis on individual piety, emotion, and living a Christian life supported by scripture and intentional social organization, Pietist groups tended to attract numbers of European social classes experiencing firsthand the transformation from a feudal to a modern capitalist economic system. As my colleague Christina Pettersen's scholarship has revealed, this transformation included a concomitant expansion into non-European mission spaces in North America, Greenland, the Caribbean, and South Africa, among others. 
The leaders of the mo movement that you see up here, um, Spener, who is, um, where is he? Oh, okay. All right, so Franke up here, Spener, Mühlenberg, Zinsendorf, um, plus in the United Kingdom, Wes the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield. We're all connected to each other. They were slightly, they weren't all concurrent, but they certainly read each other's work. They co corresponded with each other. And sometimes they fought. There's the most famous fight of all, which is Sinsendorf's with Muhlenberg at the, uh, on the steps of the church in Philadelphia, but that's a whole nother paper. Um, and their followers also were intermingled and connected. Uh, we have evidence that some of the followers of the pietists tried out one group and then decided they preferred another group. And you find texts by those individuals well, written while they were, for example, with the Methodists, and then moving to the Moravians. And that's a really interesting um, comparative study that's waiting to be done. Um, tracing the networks of these connections obviously can reveal insights into motivations, theology, financial resources, legal obstacles, and trade relations, and trade routes as well. And these connections were also recorded and reflected upon and this archival legacy of record and reflection provides a huge amount of resources to scholars today, which is where we come in, right? Um, increasingly, more interdisciplinary and international in its modes of analysis and supported by the global participation in the Congress for Pietism Research, which is held every four years at the Interdisciplinary Center for Pietism Studies in Halle, the field of Pietism Studies has grown to include, as a matter of course, perspectives from gender history, queer history, queer theory, literary studies, history of emotions, post-colonial studies, and the history of race. The latest methodological revolution to challenge this field is that of digital humanities. In the above-mentioned Pietism Handbook, the entry on digital humanities, which is placed at the as the second entry in a nearly 800-page book, outlines the history of digital methods in the field, as well as the forerunners to digital humanities in the creation of digital corpora, digitizing archival holdings, and several early DH projects that have led the way. And several of those projects are included on this panel. Today, we will focus on how collaboration between DH projects in pietism has opened up a new knowledge networks in the traditionally conservative field of pietism and religious history, and b transformed understandings of traditional disciplinary structures and hierarchies. In the field of the history of religion, <clears throat> especially in the subfield of the study of pietism, traditional disciplinary and academic hierarchies in Europe and the US have very much determined the shape and breadth of scholarship viewing, perhaps with distrust, the forays into DH that some usually newer scholars have pursued. Although the demand for software developers with a deep understanding of the needs of humanistic thinking is great, the number of practitioners of DH in the area of pietism is small. Therefore, often when DH approaches have been accepted, they have firmly been inscribed into the realm of the archive and the library and not into the curriculum. In a recent volume on the role of libraries and archives in developing in the development of linked repositories of holdings in the history of religion, published in the De Gruyter series, Introductions to DH, Clifford Anderson argues that it is in collaboration that DH can transform religious studies generally, and today we argue specifically pietism. And I just wanted to point out these are the three points that uh, Clifford Anderson makes about the importance in religious studies of these <clears throat> methods. And the last one, translatability of modalities, <clears throat> I might need to explain. What Anderson means by that is that the translation of modalities is not just interoperability between systems or sharing of data, but it actually is also how do we present what we are doing to the traditional field so that it accepts the validity of our research and also how do we translate the modality of what it is we are doing to administrators. 
Bucknell's lucky, I guess. It has an administrator now who understands this stuff and can, um, and we've always had wonderful support as well. But this is actually a very important point. If you're doing this work, are the people who are paying for you, to, for example, to come to DH 2023, do they understand exactly how important the work is that you are doing? And a recent example <clears throat> that I have um, witnessed was work in the history of emotions and digital humanities and pietism that attempted to, attempted to measure sentiment and also analyze the language of devotional metaphor within pietist autobiographies. And this work, when it was presented by a woman researcher at a pietism conference, met with immediate methodological questioning and resistance. Other newer scholars in the field sometimes face shifting their career trajectories to the archival and library track as the field in Europe is slow to respond to our methods of inquiry. However, <clears throat> in the short entry in the Pietism Handbook on the practice of digital humanities, um, what we tr I have tried to do there is to focus on how opening up the discipline despite resistance is able to move it forward and fosters innovation through active links of collaboration. In the field of textual scholarship, network analysis, sonic analysis, mapping, and cultural heritage, the methods of DH have been very successful in fostering such new directions. For example, the work you may know the work of Sarah Ierly, who's a, a musicologist, and Mark Shuchetti, um, who is a GIS expert, and their <clears throat> project called Moravian Soundscapes, which has opened up new ways of combining a sonic reconstruction of historic places to include the wilderness, to include the forest, to include the rivers and the streams and landscapes of contact, and to, do not limit their sonic reconstruction to built environments. Um, which we might know from example of St. Paul's um, Churchyard. It was one of the earliest projects that did that. Share, using shared geodata from an earlier cultural project um, that I worked on, on Native American um, cultural heritage, Ayali and Shuchetti have been able to integrate the sounds, musical scores, musicology, and missiology of the radical pietists in North America. Ayali also built on this work with historian of religion Rachel Wheeler in the collaborative project with the Stockbridge Mohican Nation in Ontario in the Singing Box Project. This digital innovation has in turn revitalized connections between the contemporary Mohican community and their Christianized past. The separate papers in this panel echo the point made by Rachel Wheeler in the recently published forum Digital Moravians in the Journal of Moravian History that although the methodology of DH invites collaboration, it does not necessarily entail equal access to such collaborative relationships. And these are primarily, these relationships are based on employment status, institutional support, third party funding, disciplinary acceptance of methodological innovation in existing publishing venues, both traditional and digital. As a panel, we will attempt to demonstrate how with our, within our ranks, we can model collaborative partnerships across disciplines, uh, ranks, and expertise. So we've tried to bring together myself, a senior US scholar, and now administrator, um, who has taught her US students DH approaches to pietistic materials, a newer scholar from Germany whose work opens up new ways of accessing and analyzing archival materials and the networks of their writers, and an established academic um, from a technical university whose work revolutionizes approaches to mission history, historical linguistics, and cultural heritage. All the papers examine individual projects that focus on aspects of pietistic research and DH methodologies, and are also collaborative partners in a transatlantic knowledge exchange network. And the hope is that this panel will open up discussions of the past towards a more collaboration between scholars across the ranks, across disciplines and languages, and across the Atlantic. So the example that I briefly want to give to you before I move on to my colleague is that of Moravian Lives, which is a bit like the grandmother of all DH Moravian projects. 
Um, that's how I feel anyway. So the, that's the example I'd like to use um, because we started early, if you like, and we have tried to always share the materials that we have developed with other scholars in the field of Moravian studies. Uh, Moravian Lives was always conceived of as a collaborative project and the initial build of the platform almost 10 years ago now was done at the University of Gothenburg where the developer basically took the um, archival record of 60,000 memoirs or autobiographical documents, turned it into a MySQL database and then was able to um, use that, pull on that to, as an API um, to be able to create a map interface in Leaflet. Subsequent to this, um, the programmer, Michael McGuire, who was a Bucknell student, went on to do a PhD in linguistics, worked with me on Moravian Lives and is now employed by the University of Gothenburg as a software engineer, built a transcription desk linked to the original metadata where the digitized memoirs from the Moravian archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania could be transcribed, crowdsourced, using Scripto plugin for a WordPress site. The transcribed memoirs, some that had tags in TEI Lite, could be scraped from a media wiki instance and then transferred to GitHub as XML files. The project then turned to use Transcribus AI to boost the speed of transcription, focusing because of the lack of German language skills among most of the um, US team on the English language memoirs from the Moravian community in Yorkshire, Great Britain. My colleague, Kerry Perman, enjoyed great success in developing models for the multiple hands in which the documents were written, which then formed the corpus on which subsequent work in sentiment analysis was performed. That was actually the subject of Mike's dissertation. A team from LNIT at Bucknell then worked to create a searchable database of a selection of these memoirs on, based on the tagging protocols developed earlier by undergraduate students using the LeafWriter platform, and some of you might have gone to that workshop that was all day on Monday, um, led by um, Diane Jakaki. And this has been very helpful in getting students to be able to um, think through tagging protocols in a, um, a graphic user interface. And here's some examples of the kind of encoding and the kinds of questions that we faced as we were thinking through how to uh, work with these particular memoirs. We were especially interested in developing a very full um, um, uh, XML and extensible customized schema for the uh, corpus. Um, and also we created a very full personography which was based on archival documentation uh, from the full neck archive um, supplemented with the information that we had developed ourselves through um, the tagging process of the memoirs. So the resultant XML files or artifacts were used to create an ontology generated from en entity resolution processes um, such as personography, placeography, and the individual memoir files. However, with the exhaustion of soft funding through the institution, and a lack of external funding, the project is stalled at this point. Whereas we had hoped to move ahead to create a normalized data model that could lead to publication as an API and website, the development um, is not moving right now. So I have to think, well, what does success look like for a project, the grandmother project of Moravian Lives, right? How, how do we define success? Even though we're not able to move forward at this point, we have been able to share certain data with other projects that work with Moravian materials. Also, we have been able to educate students in humanistic DH, right, in humanistic tagging. Um, and those students have gone on to either continue their work in graduate programs or to have, um, to have got jobs at infrastructure centers such as Gothenburg or with large corporations such as Google. Other collaborative, we also worked with other collaborative projects such as this one, Print, and this one, Migrant Connections. We're continuing work with both of these. And both of these projects draw on the exemplary work of the Franke Foundations and the Digital Franke Portal. 
because of its fabulous bio, 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 bibliographisches Register, which is linked to the Deutsche Biographie and in turn consequently linked to the authority file, the um, GND, the Gemeinsame Normdatei, and BIAC files as well. And on this, um, I just looked up Anna Nitschmann. She's, of course, very important from the Moravians. And I have um, highlighted that the fact that this immediately will take you into the DNS database to be able to find the entry for Anna Nitschmann. We are using the VIAF numbers for Anna Nitschmann in building up our personography as well. Um, print, the other, this program, this um, print has also recently won a major collaborative archival initiatives grant from the uh, National Historical Publications and Records Commission in the US that will run from next month to July 2026. And this grant will help to build up what they call an automated metadata pipeline and create metadata and linked open data for around 2,700 letters that pertain to the transatlantic Quaker movement. And then again, also linked to the Moravian Lives and Franklin Foundation personography as well. So building a DH project, as we know, demands vast human resources and capital investment in digital infrastructure, demands that can be best met by third-party funding, especially at an ins undergraduate institution such as the one that I teach at. But collaborating, sharing, refining, building together with linked projects also has the ability to re redefine the research parameters of a field as traditional as pietist studies. Thus, as we move forward, both the ability to link Moravian manuscript sources and documents to repositories of other pietist and Anabaptist movements and the opportunity to, to share data structures and methodologies has the potential to revolutionize the field. And I'm going to stop there um, and invite Philip to come up and talk about his project on Franco. So, can everybody hear me loud and clear? Okay. Thank you, Katie, for your introduction and your talk. Dear audience, you have heard about pietism in general and Moravianism, and now you'll hear about another vi variant of pietism coming from Halle. In my talk, Collaboration Through Reuse, Analyzing Letters Explored by Others, you will hear about letters present in an archives database, their historical context and relevance, and a way to analyze these letters. At the end, we'll have a look at the results of the analysis and the conclusion. The archive of the Franco Foundations, mentioned by Katie already, has stores around 79,000 letters, and you can access them via their website. I have put a link on the slide so you can browse around if you like. The letters have been analyzed for form and content by various DFG-funded projects and employees of the archives and they're continuing to work through more letters and provide more metadata. Today we have metadata like the date when the letter was sent, the place of writing, the writer and the recipient, as well as a brief summary of the content. I aggregated these letters by scraping the website, but an employee of the archive, Dr. Jürgen Gröschel, provided me with an export of the database as well. For the analysis, we'll focus on the writer and recipient field. In this case, Gottlieb August Franke sent a letter to his father, August Hermann Franke, on the 10th of March in 1725. But who are those Frankes, mentioned by Katie already? Why is there a foundation? And why is there an archive in that foundation anyways? The Franke Foundations, formerly known as Glaukasche Anstalten, have been one of the largest theological and pedagogical projects in the 18th century in Germany. You can still visit the historical buildings in Halle today, and amongst other things, they're housing a museum, a research center, parts of the Halle University, various schools, and the archive. The Anstalten have been established by August Hermann Franke in 1695 as an orphanage and a school for poor children because the physical condition of these children and the education was defined by poverty. Especially during the next 30 years and throughout the 18th century, the Anstalten grew by adding more schools for the middle and upper classes, 
a library and the archive which holds our letters. Furthermore, multiple business ventures like a successful pharmacy and a bookshop as well as a printer's office were founded to help to finance the complex. Records of these various endeavors, letters, etc., receipts, have been archived since the beginning of the 18th century. Due to the pietist nature of the founder and the Anstalten, they didn't stop at improving the education and pious lifestyle of the persons in and connected to the Anstalten, but they also sent missionaries to America and India to convert others. Born as a son of a solicitor, August Hermann Franke got in touch with pietists like Philipp Jakob Spener during his studies and before he became a priest and a professor at the newly founded University of Halle in 1691. After founding the Anstalten in 1695, he proved to be a successful manager and raised loads of funding by taking care of his networks of supporters by sending them letters. The letters also allowed him to push the pietist reform movement and cooperate with other pietists and people interested in promoting Christianity. Furthermore, he used letters to gather information and participate in theological debates. He did not only send letters, but visited his supporters as well, especially during a journey through Germany in 1770 and 18. At the time of his death, he was one of the most important persons for early 18th century theology and pedagogy and had a great deal of influence in Prussia and beyond. His son, Gotthilf August Franke, succeeded him in leading the Anstalten. He was already familiar with the Anstalten and the personnel as he grew up there, worked there during his studies, and accompanied his father during the travel through Germany in 1717 and 1718. In 1720s, he was working as a pastor in Halle, and he kept fulfilling his duties even after taking over the management of the Anstalten. He continued his father's work, but placed a bigger focus on the mission aspect. Both Frankes were writing a lot of letters to keep in touch with people and manage the various endeavors. This was not unusual for the 18th century, as the practice of letter writing surged during that century. Letters complemented the in-person visit to keep in touch with people by overcoming the physical distance. For pietists, letters have been especially important as they were not only part of their local community, but also part of an international society of believers sharing the same fears, values, and lifestyle. In principle, everybody was able to join information exchange as some letters were intentionally relayed and even read to larger audiences. Sadly, we don't have access to all of the letters sent, because if you send a letter, then you cannot archive them at your end. Furthermore, both Frankes manipulated or influenced the amount of letters that were being archived. For example, August Hermann Franke noted in his diary which letters were to be kept and which should be discarded. Of the 300 letters mentioned in the diary for January 1723, only 19% were available. Due to this influence of, on tradition and as leaders of the Anstalten, there is a bias in favor of both Frankes and the letters present in the archive of the foundation. So enough of the context, let's get to the research part. Despite there being a couple of qualitative analyses on the correspondence of individual people and a brief survey on the material by Brigitte Klosterberg, no comprehensive qualitative study is available. As I cannot analyze 80,000 letters in this talk, I reduced the amount to 9,091 letters by only taking the letters sent between 1722 and 1732 into account. So we end up with five years before the death of the older Franke and five years afterwards. This allows how to investigate how the transition of leadership from the father to the son affected their correspondence network. I will focus on the size of the network and the role that both Frankes played in it. Therefore, I use the method of historical network research because it can be used to analyze relational data. First, let's define what actually is a network. A network or graph consists of nodes and edges connecting these nodes. In this study, the nodes are the persons writing and receiving the letters, and the edges are the letters. Edges can have a direction. This means that if person A sends a letter to person B, and person B replying to this letter, there is two edges, one with the direction A to B, and one with the direction B to A. Furthermore, edges can have a weight. 
which is calculated in this case by adding all letters sent in one direction. For example, person A wrote three letters to person C, giving the edge A to C the weight of three. Please keep in mind that this correspondence not network is not the same as a full complete social network, but only a small fraction and part of it. A network can consist of multiple parts in which all contained nodes are connected. Those parts are called components. The giant component is the largest connected component and in this case contains all persons directly or indirectly connected to the fungus by at least one letter. As the databases has a bias in favor of both fungus, I will focus on their respective ego network. An ego network contains only one node called ego and its neighbors called alters. So in the ego network only Franke and his direct correspondence partners are present. I created one network for each year between 1722 and 1732 based on the available letters in the archive of the Franke foundations. To analyze these letters I use Scaphy, an open source tool to visualize and analyze graphs. The first metric to look at is the degree. It is the number of edges connected to a node. If you have weighted edges, like in this study, the weighted degree is the sum of the weight of edges connected to a node. A high weighted degree shows that a person received or sent a lot of letters and can hint at their importance. We look at the first diagram. You can see on the x-axis that it is divided into the years and 1727 is marked especially because the father died. On the y-axis, you can see the number of letters sent. The columns are split to show the letters sent and received by August Hermann Franke and his son, and the letters which have no uh, connection to the Frankes at all in the network. The first observation is the dip in the year when the father died. Looking at the total amount of letters, the full column, you can see that before 1727, around 800 letters have been sent, and it takes until 1731 until as much letters have been sent again like before. The second observation is that the son has not been engaged in a lot of correspondence while his father was still alive. But he just started to write and receive letters after the father's death, and the amount of letters he receives and sent increases almost steadily. See the orange column. Furthermore, if you look at the amount of letters without any involvement of any Franke, the gray column, you can see that the relative amount was lower during the lifetime of the father, which can indicate that he was a more central figure in the correspondence network than his son. So Gotthilf August Franke sent and received less letters than his father, but he corresponded more from 1727 onwards, and he might have had a less central role in the correspondence network. The next metric I use to determine if the network is growing or shrinking is the size. The size is equal of the number of nodes present in the network, so the number of people sending and receiving letters. Let's have a look at the diagram again. First you can see the size of the giant component, so the network only contains persons corresponding with the Frankes and their correspondence partners. The x-axis shows the years and on the y-axis you can find the number of nodes. Once again, you can see the dip in 1727, and pre-1727 the network was a bit larger. After the death of the father, it took a couple of years for the network to grow again. So network shrank when August Hermann Franke died, but it grew again. Looking at the size of the ego network, you can see that in this diagram, the year 1727 is given twice, on the left side for the father and on the right side for the son. Looking at the size of the ego network, you can find the number of nodes on the y-axis again. You can see that the network of the father is larger than his son, and despite its growth, it remains smaller. To assess the importance of the Frankes in their respective ego networks, the network density was used. It is calculated by dividing the number of existing edges by the number of maximum possible edges. With regards to ego networks, you need to remove ego from the network and then calculate the density. The higher the value, the better the alters are connected and the lower the influence of ego on the information flow. As the alters are better connected and can circumvent ego by 
corresponding with each other. You can see the density on the y-axis and you can see that the ego network of the father, August Hermann Franke, was not well connected at all. However, the network of his fun, uh, son has a higher density and was better connected. So the authors had a way to correspond with each other without involving Gotthilf August Franke directly. This can lead to the conclusion that August Hermann Franke had a more prominent position in his network, which was already hinted on by the weighted degree. Summarizing the results, August Hermann's network was bigger, despite the network of his son growing, and Gotthilf August Franke was less prominent in his network. Immediately after 1727, the differences were more significant, but they evened out slightly. So the transition of leadership worked out quite well, but it takes a bit of a time for the network to recover from the transition. These results ally with and extend existing research. So by applying qualitative, uh, quantitative or digital methods, uh, the quant qualitative research can be validated and you can use the digital methods to analyze these data and apply it in the field of research of pietism. Another thing which, would, which enables analysis is making research data avi available, but it would be even easier if the archive of the Franke Foundations was using some metadata standards or providing an API so you can just fetch all the data in one go and don't need to scrape it by yourself. Still, there's a lot of letters left in the archive which are not analyzed by anyone. And you can even consult the database to look at a huge biography where you can find a lot of information on the people that are present in the archive uh, belongings. Furthermore, you can consult more databases or other archives to broaden the scope of the research. As I have used the results of others and their efforts, you can continue the reuse and use mine. I've put the link to a GitLab repo on the slide. And thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Welcome. Uh, my name is Alexander Lesch and I'm uh, the last one in this panel to talk about uh, transforming Pietist uh, transition um, tradition. And I would give the talk uh, about uh, exploring uh, Moravian text worlds. It is an uh, extraordinary pressure to me um, for me to introduce a small part of the work of my team and of my uh, of me this afternoon and um, for about 20 years now I have been uh, dealing with questions about the Moravian Brethren Unity or the Hanuto Brüder Gemeinde or the, or the Moravian Church uh, with varying degrees of intensity. For years I tried to do this only from me and from the point of uh, German linguistics and history of German language and the language and religion, which turned out to be not very great for marketing the subject. But today I can say that we found a way to build strong partnerships by trying to include other humanities as well. And not only researchers, 
are exploring the archives. We have integrated the topic into our teaching and collaborate with citizen scientists, and that is most important for us. Only in collaboration it is possible um, for me not only to do post-colonial studies or construction grammar research like Katie uh, introduced me on a subject, but also to gain knowledge about architecture, garden design, so-called Naturalien-Sammlungen, or cartography. This is exactly the idea behind the Moravian Knowledge Network faded in. I've given you the teaser to our hypothesis blog. It's about nothing less than finding ways to recover and connect sets of knowledge to bring together scholars from different disciplines with their own questions about the Hanut or the Moravian tradition, students and citizen scientists. And I will show you some of this later in this talk. How we do that is what I want to develop today in these steps. After a short, a short introduction, I will give you an overview over the panel and over the textual cosmos of the Moravians and put it in relation to the world of the Moravian church. Afterwards, I will bring both aspects together. Before you take blurry pictures uh, with a smartphone, may I point out that uh, you can already find a presentation at Sinodo, yeah? And uh, I will leave this slide so you can uh, also search after me in person or my name and you find it as well. Okay, let's take a look um, at the Moravian church. We heard a lot of Halle and a lot of uh, pietism um, um, from Katie and from Philip, and I will look to Hanhut itself. The Moravian church can be generally understood as a pietistic community foundation. Based on various ideas, it can be traced back to Nikolaus Ludwig uh, Graf von Zinzendorf, who settled Bohemian exiles, the old Moravian Brethren community in Eastern Saxony from 1722. In 1727, the community was renewed and unlike August Hermann Franke in Halle, Zinzendorf developed a religion of the heart, in which feeling was given a very important role. You see, you see some of the dates on the slide. At the center of the community is Jesus Christ. In Christ, all people are equal if they confess him. You see here the so-called Erstlings built first fruit by Johann Valentin Haidt. Haidt implemented the central ideas and principal ideas of the community in programmatic pictorial designs as like this, to which I as linguist uh, have only limited access. I don't know if uh, any of you are uh, an art historian uh, to help me to um, describe this picture. Yeah? You see, we have to collaborate with other disciplines to explain um, the rich um, heritage of the Moravians. The first principle of the community is equality. Equality of genders, equality of nations. In principle, all believers can be recognized and awakened by God. Faith and awakening are regarded as signs of God's electing grace. All awakened members of the community are equal in Christ. This equality is not only expressed in programmatic texts or in images uh, like heights, but it becomes, like simplicity and plainness, a guiding principle of the community. Here you can see the assembly hall in Hanhut uh, before its restoration. Uh, the photo is taken in 2001. Just as the members of the community are seated separately by gender and organized by houses, listen to their worship service, they also brought down to us if they have, as they say, passed through time. And this is also uh, the principle of equality yeah, that you can see in architecture. 
In this understanding, uh, the Moravians are unique. While we also encounter the concept of predestination in other Christian communities, which is the idea of attaining eternal life after death, Moravians are certain of it. Those who live in the community and are allowed to particip uh, participate um, in the communion are already chosen for the Lord's community in this earthly life. They only live one life and only um, uh, go to another place uh, where they live further. For reasons that I cannot delve into today, Zinzendorf perceives the Moravian Church as a so-called pilgrim community that lives out the missionary mandate of Jesus Christ. In German, after Matthew 28, 16 till 20, Darum geht hin und lehret alle Völker, tauft sie auf den Namen des Vaters, des Sohnes und des Heiligen Geistes und lehret sie halten alles, was ich euch befohlen habe. Und siehe, ich bin bei euch alle Tage bis an der Welt Ende. And the Moravians are very active, very active uh, uh, in the mission fields. They are building a global network in only a few years that not uh, particular, uh, uh, practically without any experience or financial resources that not only connect the, the old and the new world, but also brings together people of various nations leading to exchange of goods and knowledge. Moreover, it ch uh, challenges our discipline-orientated humanities. While I won't delve into it separately in this talk, I want to say it clearly um, that we strive to approach the subject from a post-colonial perspective too, yeah? but I cannot talk about it today. The third one. This is leading to the third principle, reflexivity. However, in order to prove oneself as a member of the community and to demonstrate the state of one's own heart, a high degree of self-reflection is necessary. Moreover, methods of examination and documentation must be developed that illustrate both personal growth in Jesus Christ and on the one hand and the progress of God's work uh, on the other hand. Over the years, we can recognize linguistic and textual patterns, um, architecture, garden culture, and so on. Um, patterns in this documentation, a Moravian style, if you, so, if you like. That brings me to the second point, Moravian texts. With a history of almost 300 years and the will to document you can perhaps already guess why I have dedicated a separate chapter to Moravian texts. I will give you here only a very brief overview of the text, genres and sources that have the highest relevance for me as a linguist. I focus here with, uh, the first on the mediated artifacts, not the artifact itself. In reports and records, the Moravians summarized their community work and decisions. One of the most important sources might be the so-called records of the Unitate's Eldesten Conference, Unity Elders Conference, a part of uh, which is currently being digitized in the Moravian Archive Bethlehem. Communication between different locations and people is realized through letters like Philip showed. Yeah. Um, part of which is also being copied in order to make them available to a wider public. They are then disseminated like a large number of sermons and biographies, um, Moravian lives, uh, Katie mentioned, and diaries, travel and mission reports, for example, in the so-called Gemeinnachrichten uh, from uh, 1765 which are initially copied by hand and given away to our community members on interested uh, friends. From the early 19th century on, also uh, printed as the so-called Nachrichten aus der Brudergemeine from 1819 to 1894 or five, and then as, uh, then as Mitteilungen aus der Brudergemeine. We have a um, uh, close corpus about 300 years um, that we can um, analyze 
in network analysis or corpus linguistics. This is framed by translations and major missionary narratives. Unfortunately, I'm not um, a musicologist. And so I can't um, uh, analyze the great song collections that we have uh, uh, from the Moravians. As you must know, in self-understanding, the Moravians are a singing community, not a writing community. And uh, that may be uh, one of the keys to analyze the community and her practices. In addition to these uh, um, easily accessible, but not always easily accessible uh, sources, church records are also kept. Herbaria of Moravian provenance appear in collections. We find cartographic collections and much more, and so on. It would be nice if we then had only one corpus language, yeah, such as English or German. And it's a little absurd to speak in English today um, because um, the main language of the Moravian sources in the 18th century is German, of course. If you approach the Moravian sources, you must also have a good knowledge of German. It's true that gradually English is also becoming more important for the community in the, uh, later in the 18th century, but only as a secondary language, which is really interesting from a linguistic perspective. The text for the daily faith work, in example, central uh, Bible passages, songs, uh, songs and so on, um, are available um, in, very, uh, in a great amount of languages, some of which the Moravians recorded for the first time ever uh, in, for example, in North America. To explore Moravian texts, music sheets, plant collections, and so on, we build up a next generation uh, reference corpus, in short, NARC, uh, for the Moravian Knowledge Network in cooperation with the Sächsische Landesbibliothek, Staats- and Universitätsbibliothek, I love this name, uh, short, in short, SLUB, or SLUB. And this corpus will uh, address a very um, a large scale of interests for many scientists. And I only will look on linguistic, historical, discourse, linguistic, and construction, grammatical um, um, issues that I can't um, evolve today. But we are uh, working together on these resources. Maybe, and that's the main question um, on this um, collaboration is that we want to understand the global effects of European expansionism, uh, uh, which the uh, Moravians documented. And I will show you the resources that you always can use today. Yeah? We have um, uh, the so-called Sachsen Digital. It is um, a portal that you can, uh, or where you can uh, show at the uh, handwritten Gemeinnachrichten um, from 1764 to 1860 and uh, as well as a German language sources from the Moravian archive in Bethlehem. Um, they are also all available uh, at the source of Mary Sings. Um, at this place, I go to one of my student assistants, Marlene Wolf, who created over 10,000 entries by hand from the uh, Gemeinnachrichten uh, for sure. Yeah. You can see an excerpt from this list, a little one, yeah, um, on this slide. The Nachrichten of the Brüdergemeine, uh, which were printed from 1890, uh, 1890 on, are not only available to us in uh, still, still to be optimized version, but are also available to, our, um, to you as a special corpus um, at the Deutsches Textarchiv, uh, which you see uh, left uh, on the button. We report on all this on Moravian Knowledge Network blog. Here you can find um, information about our corpora, and also presentations, publications, and activities. You see it uh, in the right corner. How we work? Um, we see um, uh, Catherine worked with uh, Transcribus um, to um, uh, translate and uh, um, the handwritten um, sources. You see a digitized image of a letter from the Gemeinnachrichten from 1806. Um, if you look behind, this is the text aus einem Briefe des Bruder David Seisbergers in Goschen am Muskingum an Bruder Gotthold Reichel in Salem am 17. Mai 1805. It's very well written, you, if you can uh, uh, read in German and like a little bit in German current, 
uh, there's a way to, to get this text, uh, but um, I would say not many of us can uh, read a German current. And so we uh, build up a German current podcasts where we um, ask <laughs> citizen scientists, uh, old, old people, yeah, um, to read the texts for us. So can, you can listen to the podcast and you have the, the images and so you can learn um, to read the current uh, with um, uh, uh, the podcast. It's a very cool tool and uh, I wonder why we are the first who made this. Yeah. Okay, uh, we used um, Larex to um, the build up the structure and the training material for UCR, uh, which we realized with the SLOB. That only I, I only want to show you how the workflow is uh, in Dresden. It's a little bit separate from from Bucknell, but we tried this way and uh, try to to keep the the citizen scientists and the students together and to build up a commu local community for collaboration um, and to have fun work with each other at one place. Okay, so let's take a look at Moravian worlds. I talked a lot of, about texts and that's not all. And then we have to, uh, because we have to um, know a lot about um, the special conditions. Uh, uh, if you look to the Moravian church uh, in the mission fields, um, and I show you uh, something like this uh, on this image of David Zeisberger. This is a historicizing picture you see of one of the most influential missionaries among the Native Americans, David Zeisberger Jr., I would say. And he was born in uh, Moravia in 1721. And his parents, David and Rosina, were among the first families who live in Hanhut from 1726. It is clear to me that one could describe the Moravian people's engagement uh, in colony, uh, colonial contexts in more detail, just on the basis of this picture by Christian Schüssel. But I want to leave it at that today, at this comment, um, because you, uh, just because um, we Europeans, and I include white America, point at the things that does not mean that we are working together with Native Americans, for example, on a new history. Um, that should be our task. David Zeisberger Jr., as I said, was born in 1721 and his parents came to Herrnhut and were among the first missionaries to travel um, to Georgia. Uh, David Jr., uh, as I may call it now, uh, went to Georgia in 1738. Uh, uh, the problem is this, uh, that um, his father, David Zeisberger, and he, he David Zeisberger, uh, will uh, always called like this. And you see, for example, um, uh, the, the place where David Zeisberger um, uh, or the Gottes Acker in Bethlehem lies on the Gottes Acker in Bethlehem, but it's not the David Zeisberger Jr., which I mean. Yeah? So I uh, only mention, uh, only a, a, a mention worth at the moment. Okay, and this are only, uh, is a map in progress we built with UMAP, and that's an open source tool um, that you can easily use and bring information together. I will show you uh, some details in the talk. And um, uh, I will go to Pennsylvania on the next step. In 1739 uh, or 1740, uh, David Jr. moved to Pennsylvania and was involved with his family, founding the settlements of Nazareth and Bethlehem. And, uh, you might recognize this colleague here left in this picture, that's Katie, and one of my, uh, two of my PhD students, uh, namely D uh, Dominic and, and Robert, who went to Pennsylvania last summer um, to make 3D models of historical places of the Moravians. If you like, you can use your phone and uh, take a, um, 
uh, take a look at the 3D models of the Cray, Cot uh, Cray Cottage and the Whitfield House, which built the Moravians for Whitfield and, uh, in Method. And this one, this two one I can show you today, um, but um, I will take also a look in the browser in the discussion maybe to show you more of the um, possibilities with these models, yeah? Okay. And we need these places to, to show how the people live and where they go and what they do in their lives. And today, the Woodfield House, I will show you later, is a museum where you can see all letters and um, uh, pictures and other things that connected to the Moravians. And if you know Hernut in um, Eastern Saxony, um, you will also be familiar with all the things you see in this Whitfield House in Netherrad, Pennsylvania. And to show this to students, um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, interest uh, them in the, um, in the issue. Okay, that's the last point for me. Moravian text worlds, how we bring this together. Yeah, we have 3D models, we have uh, UMAP, we have text. We, uh, how we bring this together in um, uh, teaching and researching contexts. Okay, Moravian text words. One of my favorite uh, letters uh, that we have uh, digitized in the Gemeinachten is one of uh, Bruder David Seisberger. I, I read it uh, short. Uh, nun folgt uh, noch ein kurzer Bericht von Bruder David Seisbergers Reise mit den Indianerbrüdern, sorry for this, Isaac and Wilhelm to the Chavanosen. Um, in English, a short report about uh, travel from uh, David Seisberger with uh, two uh, natives uh, in 1774. What to know about this travel and this letter? Um, you can see a quote of Zeisberger, um, and he explains that the Moravians are not to be confused with the kind of white people called Sunday Indians or Shawnaks by the natives. Uh, Sunday Indians are people who go only in church. Yeah, uh, 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 go in church. Um, it's a um, imperative. Um, term for, um, yeah, later on for the white people. Self-positionings like this are not surprising when one recalls the principle of the Moravians. In Christ, all are equal regardless of gender, regardless of nation. The Moravian sources can be considered yeah, as an important corrective to our Western view of the world. Yeah, this is um, in uh, one, one resource that uh, shows that. But that's not the only one. You can see here a letter from 1806. Aus einem Briefe des Bruder Zeisbergers aus Goshen an Moskimo. He will die in Goshen. Um, few, few, uh, I think uh, two years later, one year or two years later. And um, Zeisberger was considered extremely gifted um, and talented in uh, language learning. But unfortunately, we know very little about uh, his education in Pennsylvania. Only one thing is clear today. He documented and learned in um, many languages wherever he could. In the quote, he reflects exactly this. Um, in German, das gehört auch dazu, eine Sprache zu lernen. Und je mehr man hineinkommt, desto mehr Lust kriegt man. He's a uh, linguist, uh, if you like, and I will show you what this means to the Europeans. I will, uh, I'm, I'm not good at French, so I will show you the English summary of this. Um, you only have to know that Wilhelm von Humboldt um, uh, writes to Peter Stephen Dupont Co. Uh, um, uh, on, uh, in April 1823, and Humboldt was, um, convinced um, that further studies of the so-called wild languages of North America 
would be found and he evaded sized by a scrammer uh, with impatience. But Humboldt never held the grammar of the so-called Onondogan, uh, a North European language, um, in his hands, which um, he asked for several times to Peter Stevenko. And I will show you something interesting. What if we have the grammar today? We digitized it uh, in collaboration with, with the Moravian Archive Bethlehem. And on the right hand, you see uh, the first transcription of the grammar um, that we will publish in a few months. What I will show you is that Zeisberger is part of a network that um, shares knowledge around the world. And language is not the only knowledge you can share. You can uh, share, um, uh, you see here, the Moravian Knowledge Archive, um, the, um, the knowledge that shared in the 18th and 19th century about grammar or languages, but it is, it is also shared knowledge about garden art, architecture and, and so on. And I will show you this, this is a so-called Kinderplantage, uh, where not uh, childs are raised, uh, but uh, it's a playground for, for uh, children in Kleinwelka uh, uh, station uh, a so-called Ortsgemeine uh, in the near of Herrnhut. And it's possibly, uh, I don't want to say it in public, but I say it now. It's possible that we have two, you see two little rondels uh, up in, the, uh, in the upper corner in this um, um, uh, image. And maybe that are some of the first green classrooms we have uh, on track. Thanks to Dora Kinderman and Josefine Salomo to find this uh, great uh, detail in, in the archives. And the last one are uh, uh, Naturalgensammler, plants um, that were um, sent from all over the world um, to Germany um, and used in the uh, education in um, Barbie or Hanhut or Niski and so on. I will show you this later in uh, on a browser, uh, browser feed. Okay. To give it, um, to make a long story short, if we want to collaborate digital, we have to collaborate in person. Yeah. Um, Robert and um, Dominic visited um, Kathy in um, Pennsylvania, and on the right you see Juan Garces um, from the SLB. He's not here today. Um, in Gnadental, uh, South Africa. And we want to show um, some details about Moravian lives and historical places. And we use um, these um, tools uh, to work together. Um, we track um, traces or records on UMAP. We share um, data on Wikidata. Um, we have GitHubs, we use Sotero. Um, this publication or this presentation you can find on Zenodo and about all this we report on the blog uh, and uh, uh, Moravian Knowledge Network. Okay, that's it for today and for the um, discussion I want to show you some details in the browser but thank you uh, for today. Thank you. I have a very 
good projection, but I will use this. Um, during COVID, I discovered that a lot of, um, especially research students, were using the Moravian Lives website to be able to do the archival research that they weren't able to do because of travel restrictions. And um, the one way, there's a way built into the Moravian Lives website where you can see who has accessed one of the memoirs um, in the Scripto plugin. And also you can see any kind of changes that they've made, any kind of comments that they have made as well. So within um, for my repository, that is a very, that was built into the platform. Um, but also anything that is published by our research team goes into our digital commons at Bucknell University and that tracks every view, every user, maps it, everything else. And that's really important, obviously, not only to see who's interested, but also for us to be able to say, this is a really good reason to make sure that, as um, Alexander is doing with the Moravian Knowledge Network, that those, those um, posters, those presentations, those articles are being read. Um, and it's good for lots of reasons, right? For the, for the administration, like I talked about in terms of translating modalities, you need that kind of data to be able to justify being able to spend that much money on, on, on creating that digital resource. So I don't know if that helps you. Okay, I don't know if you wanna answer that too. Okay, um, uh, in Dresden we, we work uh, a little bit uh, uh, I would say uh, we, we show students how to work with the text, but uh, in the back end there are professionals who do all of the work, yeah? Um, and that's okay because we want mainly, and that's, I think it's a difference to, to your students, uh, they should learn current. They should learn how to read, like yeah? To yeah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but my students can German, maybe, and um, they have to read or they have to learn to read current. Yeah? And that's another question, another uh, issue, another task. And uh, so our, um, our uh, uh, methodology is quite different. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know especially about the tracking of the archive of the Franke Foundations but I guess you can just contact them. They're super nice and very helpful. So if you have any questions, contact them. I think they're tracking it somehow because you can see the users online currently, but I don't know anything else. And we track all of our social media, podcasts, videos, and so on, YouTube, and so on. And so you can see if there are any interests in this topic, yeah. Uh, social media is, is very great for this, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Example, yeah, such like this, yeah. Um, okay, who was next? I'm gonna okay, go first. Yes, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I have a question for Philip. Um, I was wondering, because I was working with the archive a little bit, and there are, in some cases, there are, um, is data on the people that are mentioned in the letters. How is that for the letters that you are looking at, and would that be a possibility to uh, create like a citation network in a way? Have you thought about that? Yeah, there's another field, it's called genannte person, so mentioned persons in the letters. So you have most of the persons that are deemed worthy to be included in this field mentioned there. And I was thinking of like a co-occurrence network that you can create and then have a look at that and see if there's difference in the network of the son and the father. But sadly, I did not have the time to investigate that. And what you then can even further do, take in account the biography of those persons and then, for example, look at the occupations they had, at the gender, and if you can then find some commonalities or some other findings. Yeah. 
I realize it's a different corpus, but in the Moravian memoirs, I did exactly what you said, um, uh, to look at who's mentioned and not just recipients and senders. And it was really interesting because if you looked at just recipients and senders, you'd think, yes, this, the separate gender spheres are maintained, right? But when you look, about, look, when you look instead at mentions, um, it, that completely changes. Um, and anyway, yes, so, but that's a different corpus. That's in the, letters, in the, in the memoir corpus from Moravian Live, so great question. So I aggregated the uh, uh, mentioned person fields well. So if you're interested, I think they're separated by semicolon. You can then use it. Or you, or you talk to the people at the archive because scraping the website is quite a task because sometimes it crashes because it's not the most reliable website. But if you're interested, you can just reuse my data and get in touch with me. Thank you, Annette. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, some very interesting uh, presentations. And uh, it's really impressive, I think, what you have uh, been doing here. And I just wanted to know if um, have this, tr not that the uh, pietists are not interesting, but has this framework also been used uh, for other groups? Because I really think that this could serve as a model that could be used in many other uh, areas. Uh. When you say as a framework, you mean in terms of collaborative sharing of data? Yes, or? and also as a framework for presentation and access and gathering. And, and because what's really interesting, I think, is here that, that these digital approaches, they, they really enable us to get new answers. And, mm -hmm. and this is a very good example of this, that that the mere fact that you have them, uh, the comparability and you have the access mm -hmm. enables us to make new comparisons that you couldn't do without. So. I think that's a great question. Just last night at the reception, actually, I was talking to a paparologist who's giving his talk this afternoon at four o'clock. And we were talking about how paparology, you might think this is, you know, the most archaic and <laughs> arcane of a field actually was the leader in creating standards that all paparologists use, which is incredibly helpful. I mean, we have come across our own problematics because of the different standards that are used by different archives in terms of nomenclature and tagging, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we, are, we have been trying to work towards normalizing that. Um, but I think that if we can look to another field and say, this is how this has been done, um, it will help our argument very much. So I don't know if you want to add anything uh, to that. I will, I will show you, I will show you uh, another, another issue, how we can work together in the digital field of presentation. Um, that's the Whitfield House in Nazareth, Beth, uh, Pennsylvania. And it's a museum today. And this, uh, in this slide, I showed you the uh, QR codes for this. Uh, please try it out. It's amazing. Yeah? You can use VR and such on. And we use a commercial service, Metaport, to do these models. Mm -hmm. And um, I will show you only, only one thing. I talked about um, um, the mm, thinking community. Yeah? Let me take, go here. And here you see in the museum the first instruments that built in North America by Germans. Yeah, and we have a guitar, and maybe some of you plays guitar and knows um, the Nazareth as a place where guitars came from. Martin guitar. Yeah. And uh, you see maybe the first piano built in North America. And then will will you go to this convention? You see um, <laughs> portraits that uh, uh, are painted. Uh, by Valentin Hyde, and so on. And this models uh, uh, opens a room for any questions to talk about, yeah, and say, well, what is this? What is that? Because what a man and a woman equal to each other in uh, several paintings, and so on. And that's a great field to, uh, or maybe a possibility to, uh, to other communities to show their stuff like this.
and no, none of my students will, will ever be a Methoreth by public uh, uh, a foundation, yeah. Um, did you, was that, uh, did you, did we answer your question? Yes, I think so, yeah. Thank okay, all right. So, uh, thank you, that was very, that's very but kind I, of yeah. you. But, but I think we'll leave. We're trying, we're trying to make this work, uh, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for your very inspiring presentations and uh, for uh, uh, the openness in providing all these uh, created data sets. And uh, uh, to the first uh, question, I, I can provide uh, some data. Uh, uh, we used the Nachrichten von der Brühlgemeinde in the German text, ar text archive um, uh, and in the dictionary, digital dictionary of the German language and we had uh, several thousand corpus queries since last summer or, or so, uh, about 10,000 corpus queries explicitly querying uh, these uh, Nachrichten from, from the, yeah. yes, these sub yeah. It's a great pleasure to have you here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have two questions. Um, uh, could you say something about uh, uh, the direct cooperation uh, with the yeah. members of the Moringen Church besides asking them for providing better APIs? Yeah. And uh, the second uh, is connected to the, f to the first. Um, uh, how do you deal with uh, contem contemporary uh, activities um, from the uh, uh, Herrnhuter Brüdergemeinde and the Moringen people? Uh, do you integrate uh, these data uh, now or do we have to wait another 200 years before there's another project? Um. Well, no, it's just, so the second question first, so for me with uh, autobiographical documents, there was a 70 year limit, right? And that the synod uh, that was just held in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, just reduced that to 50 years. So the answer is yes, um, it'll be a 50 year wait and not a 70 year wait for the personal documents, all right? But it's not easy um, to uh, to analyze, describe, uh, and uh, to find a scientific um, uh, approach to uh, a living community is not easy. And uh, the uh, the Moravian Church existed exists uh, 300 years, and our lives are are such like this. And if they close the door, uh, the door is closed. And um, so we have uh, very careful to talk about actual um, or implanting actual uh, complementary documents or resources or activities um, in the research and better stay on focus on the 18th and 19th century at the moment. But um, we have a lot of activities, uh, especially with the Native Americans. Yeah, Katie can talk about a lot of it. Um, where we try to get in touch with uh, the natives um, to communicate about um, uh, our history and um, only communicate, only try to communicate, communicate, yeah, that's it. If I could just, as a quick answer to that last point. So I've been working over the last 15 years with Native American communities in Pennsylvania. I have contacts with the Onondaga Nation, Seneca, Mohawk, and also the Napé as well. Um, and I think one of the projects to look at, as which I mentioned in my introduction, which is paradigmatic for establishing contemporary relations with Native American communities is the work that Sarah Ierly and Rachel Wheeler have done in the Singing Box Project. Um, because the Mohican community in um, Ontario has used the historical materials that other researchers have um, made available for their own purposes, for their own cultural development, of course, right? Um, and also for linguistic um, revitalization projects as well. So I think, Tina? Thank you very much, and thank you for this very, very interesting and uh, rich uh, panel. Um, I have a couple of uh, many questions, uh, uh, but I will try to limit myself to one to each of you. So first, 
for for Katie's uh, presentation, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit about what um, or uh, what are your thoughts on what is the um, implications of this new bottom-up uh, or uh, approach to pietism? Because as you also um, just briefly uh, touched upon that, and which maybe also relates to 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 the latest uh, question. Uh, there is a potential conflict with regards to their to self perception of some of the people in the community and the conservatism there, which could collide yes. with a bottom up uh, 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 perspective and studies that enables people to um, to access a lot of these. Uh, uh, new sources, or maybe not new, but new, newly accessible sources, uh, that also could challenge um, the balance between what is considered normative and what is then the actual practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that uh, uh, is mm -hmm. like a complex of, uh, mm -hmm. of dilemmas and problems, mm -hmm. maybe, potential, or, but also where really new insights could uh, stem from, I think. Uh, for for Philip, I, I was wondering, uh, can you point to any good uh, he, uh, connections between what you say these um, distant, in a way, distant reading uh, network analysis, and then the quality? You said it. Uh, you mentioned uh, at last in your uh, presentation that there was they they could be used to to validate some of the more qualitative uh, readings. Do you have any um, thoughts on how we could, in a good way, combine uh, these things so that it's not one validating the other, but a more intense dynamic between the two? Um, and then for the la la last uh, presentation, um, I was one, it, it struck me that the, the new, uh, things you have made is a way of presenting uh, a context if, as a parallel to intellectual history. What you ki kind of have provided here is a context to ideas or uh, you could maybe say a virtual context to uh, ideas. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or is that kind of a, or is, uh, do you have any paradigmatic uh, Backdrop. So do we all want to go and worry about all the gosh, Tina? <laughs> you should have been our responder, right? <laughs> um, so as you know, in terms of the um, the Lebensläufe, the memoirs, there is a very delicate balance between my intellectual or let's say scholarly investigation of individual lives, historical and contemporary and the actual, if you like, pastoral purpose of writing the memoir. And someone like Jill Vogt uh, in Helmhut has reestablished the whole practice of writing a memoir um, as a process of reflection. And I think that if we have mutual respect on both sides, that these, are both, these, are, these practices are serving different ends that we can hopefully not um, antagonize a group which does still very much see itself as not separate from the world, or, but as identifying itself through a whole series of habitus, right? Um, and I think that that is something that anyone who works on this community has to accept when they're working both with historical documents that might reveal, that might counter the accepted history of the project, of, of the um, group, and also recognize that there are people who are still living this way, right? They still have this um, idea. And I'm thinking especially of the whole way in which within the Moravian church there has been this re-evaluation and reframing of the question of race and so the things that um, Alexander was pointing to in terms of equality, um, 
there are historical, there is historical evidence that this was a, um, how can I put it? This was an equality that was not based on equal agency within the historical Moravian church, whether this was working within the missions with Native Americans or, or in the Caribbean with um, enslaved Africans, etc. And so the whole question of slavery has really invited the Moravian church to rethink some of these held tenets, and it has to be done carefully. So I don't know whether or not that answers your question, but I'll pass the microphone to you. Thank you for the question. I think it's, you can either use the network analysis as a different view on the data and letters, and then, for example, pick a year which you think is interesting, because, for example, in 1725, I think there's like 1,200 letters suddenly, so it's quite the search, and then you can go on from there, or you look at the ego network of August, uh, Gotthilf August Frank, and you see at the start it's quite small, and then you could investigate who is part of this network, read the letters, or go on to look at groups of persons that are contacted by either father, so for example the missionaries, and then maybe see, ah, in 1728 there's a search in letters to the missionaries, or if you Another example that comes to my mind is the connection to the Prussian king. And at the end of 1732, the relationship between Franke and the king deteriorates. And you could investigate how that is visible in the letters. First, from a quantitative approach, how many letters have been written before. And then you dive deeper into the actual letters and some of them are even transcribed and available in the archive. And then you can also do it the other way around, go from your, from your qualitative analysis of a phenomenon back to the quantitative analysis and have like an, a circle and enriching both sides of the analysis. And I can only invite people to do it. 9,000 letters for like 10 years. There's I guess there's enough qualitative analysis to be done for <laughs> at least 10 years. And then that's, <laughs> that's only like a small portion. Yeah. Or you look at, mentioning groups, you can look at women writing in the network. I think 10% of the notes in the network are female, but there's not a lot letters sent between females. So I, you could investigate those and then have a look at letters written by females, not only from 1722, but to 32. Or you pick any person and investigate that, which might be interesting for you. Okay, uh, is this working? Please go. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your questions. I, I will make it short. Uh, I sell imaginations. That's it. Um, we have, uh, I'm a linguist, we only look at texts. Yeah? thousands, thousands of letters, and we make corpus linguistics, and we make graph and uh, statistics on this, yeah, and say, okay, this word comes together with this, or this is a metaphor, or this is not. But it, that's not the way how we can interest in the public in this thing, or students. Um, I'll show you Klein Welker. Klein Welker is the, the, missions, the mission place where every missionary went to school, and then to Niski, then to Barbie, then to North America, South Africa. Every, everyone was there in this little place in the near of Bautzen. And uh, we have, uh, I have shown you this map of the, of the playground of the boys. This is a called Kinderplatage, uh, a little uh, north of the, of the uh, center of this little place. And we have the so-called Winchesru. That's another place where we have found special trees that shows that they are planted for the kids in this place. And the kids went through the streets to the Kinderplantage or the Winchester School to play there. And everyone today can go to Klein Welka and go this path and visit these places and can connect um, emotionally to this place. And then I can say, Georg Heinrich Loskiel was also there. And then we have the translation to North America and everybody is count in. And we talked about a lot of funding these projects. If I go to uh, DFG or VW or BMBF or Thyssen or some, uh, it's, 
and say, I have uh, a lot of texts and I want to digitize them and then I want to build a corpus and then I want to analyze the corpus, no one will give any money to me. But if I show a 3D model of the Whitfield House, Nethered, and the, show the text, and uh, students have to work with this model, everyone says, great, you're welcome, here's your money, and um, then we can digitize our texts with a part of this money. That's, that's the way, yeah. It's a marketing tool and a lot to engage people to build an emotional connection to the issue. That's it. Okay, I think we probably can do one more question. We can finish at 12.30, right? Yeah. You guys are awesome. Yeah, thank you. It um, go, sorry, it, sh it should go with Christiansfeld. Yeah? Sorry, I think we are out of time. I have only a short question. Uh, first of all, I'm very impressed. Thank you for the presentation. And um, I like the almost uh, holistic picture you painted from the Moravian uh, community. But um, I'm wondering, are there any theologians involved in your projects? Um, how's the response um, by theologians in yeah. Germany and in the US? I have a few names in mind, but maybe you can. Tell me who you're thinking of. <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> this is like a quiz show. <laughs> I would say, <laughs> yeah. Three, two, three, four people. Yeah. yeah. So one of the, th uh, well, a professor of church history who's very involved in this um, is Wolfgang Breuel at the University of Mainz, um, who has also developed his own um, project from the diaspora, the Moravian diaspora as well. Um, uh, Rachel Wheeler in the US is actually a historian of religion as well. And what's very interesting is to see how the American Academy of Religion has really developed um, its own guidelines for evaluating DH projects, as well as a whole stream of panels. Um, and I have a colleague who I, I teach at DH, well, I have taught at DHSI, which is the uh, UVic summer school for DH. Um, and what was really interesting is that some scholars of religion who've taken classes with me there are developing projects that are actually super similar to what Alexander has done within, in New Jersey and working with the Muncie um, people of northern New Jersey in um, cultural heritage work, public-facing cultural heritage work. So who are you thinking of? <laughs> You're not going to say. <laughs> but I mean, when I said in my introduction, there's a whole bunch yeah. who, if you're go, you have to be careful where you present, if you like, so that if you present at um, a conference which is predominantly a traditional pietism conference, you know, there's going to be some, a lot of feathers ruffled, right? Because this is not, and, and, and I guess the way I would say is, is that, so when I talked a little bit about the history of emotions, um, especially when you're thinking about pietism, when you're thinking about affect, and you're thinking about sentiment, the idea of assigning a number to, a, uh, to an emotional reaction is antithetical to a lot of the ways in which traditional historians of religion or theologians think about, um, about devotion. So. Uh, we are in post-colonial studies and uh, uh, to talk about uh, faith and to talk about community and talk about whites uh, in North America, South Africa, in the Caribbean, in uh, South America uh, brings a lot of problems um, with it and um, as linguist or as um, historian or we have enough to do to understand the whole thing. And we have theological in, um, in the framework. And um, maybe with a little bit of luck, uh, we got a, a talented um, uh, one uh, next time in Dresden. And uh, I will, uh, can, can talk to you and say a name or two uh, besides the live stream, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. I think we're done. Thank you very much for being the brave and the few. And um, uh, it was great to have you here. We'd love to talk to you some more. Thank you. Thank you.